Hello, everyone, and welcome to Toast Time, episode three. Uh, I know last week we didn't get we didn't get to it. Uh, me and Jackson were both very busy, but fear not. We are back here, Toast Time, episode three, the Thanksgiving episode uh, here on the Vendetta Sports Network, and we are recording on November the 25th at 6.42 p.m. So I'll start us off here, uh, Buttery is our positive segment and uh it's like the one is, positive segment this we is, have this is probably the yeah, i would say it's the only one we have <laughs> the only time you will get credit <laughs> is if you're up in these first 15 minutes of the show <laughs> if, if if you're not here um uh, you should be worried but i'll get us started so first up for buttery uh is my man uh my coach joe judge i <laughs> I love what Joe Judge has done with the Giants, and as a as a Giants fan, it, it's very it's very nice to see the way this team is playing. Uh, with past within the past like couple of years, we went from Ben McAdoo, Pat Shermer, they've they were both horrible, horrible coaches. Uh, the culture was disgusting. It was like absolutely horrendous. We got guys fighting, fighting each other in the locker rooms, and you know Odell marrying a kicking net after he beat it up one week. Uh, it's just so much, so much has happened. And I tell you what, Joe Judge came in, and no one really knew too much about him. All they knew was that he came from the Patriots, uh, from the Belichick coaching tree. So he was a special teams coach. But I tell you what, he has done a great job, and. Like people, if you've been watching the Giants all season, like I have, they've gotten better every single week, and they've been in really close games with a lot of good teams. Like they were really close against the Bucks. Probably should have ended up winning that game. Um, they were even close in Week One against the Steelers when we put when the Giants played just a pretty bad game uh, offensively. But you know they've been doing a lot better. And Joe Judge, uh, for the talent that he has on that team, he's been coaching the hell out of them, and they they play for him. And you know, he doesn't take no crap like that stuff with Golden Tate about no oh, get throw me the ball and all that. That got nipped in the butt real quick. Mark Colombo tried fighting the the Joe Judge head coach, fired, gone. You're out of here. There was. He's taking no crap from nobody, and it's just really nice to see as Giants fans. I'm so sick of hearing every day about how New York sports is in peril because, no, it's not. It's not in peril. The Giants are in a playoff race. Whether you like it or not, the Giants are in a playoff race, okay? I I don't want to hear it. So Joe Judge uh, is my buttery pick this week. He's been absolutely great, and I just love to see and can't wait to see what else he's got in store for us. Just looking at the Giants' schedule, I I I, I could I can't believe this, and this is you know a big difference in where they've been at previously, and also means the difference in the tone uh, of the season, and it shows kind of how close they are. They have five losses that are one possession, at least that what I can see right here, just kind of off rip. You have losses to the Bucks, Eagles, Cowboys. Rams and Bears, they're all one possession. And even and like you said, even week one against the uh the Steelers, you kept it they kept it fairly close. They come out with three or four of those games. It's a completely different season. And this is about the only team in the NFC uh East that's got any hope for the future. Uh back to back wins is positive. Um, they're going to go up against a banged up Bengals team that just lost Joe Burrow for the season, maybe even more so because the way that they were talking about his injury, that it's usually nine to 12 months to full recovery. And if it's 12 months, then that means that Burrow is going to miss the first half of next season too. So who knows when we're going to see uh, uh, Joey Burrow back on the field. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's a pretty good pick. I think that judge is, starting to establish, reestablish the culture 
the winning culture, even, even though it's odd to say winning culture when they're three and seven, yeah. but they're, they're close. It's you as a Giants fan, you can look at the season. Like you can look at games, you know, like the Buccaneers, like the Eagles, uh, you know, losses to those teams, even teams against like the Rams and be like, okay, we're, we're almost there. You know, may, perhaps next year, maybe a couple more of those games go our way and we start winning those closer games because that's the thing that was is what helped my Miami Dolphins this year is that they're winning those those close games, which is different from the season before that and previous seasons where we would lose those close games. And winning those close games is the next step before you start, you know, truly winning games where you're winning by double digits or even blowing teams out. So uh, Giants fans – yeah, you got. You seem to have a pretty good coach there, and judge, and got a good future. Yeah, it's uh, it's about time. It's it's really about time. It's kind of just been like we've been living in the shadow of Tom Coughlin ever since he left, and you know, it, it, it yeah. just, it, I it, think it's nice to finally see someone in there that like controls the locker room with like an iron fist. Mm-hmm. And I think things would be better if you didn't have Gettleman as your GM. Yeah, Get I'm, someone else in there that is more willing to understand what is working and what isn't working in the system and then go out and get players that fit that system better. Uh, then, yeah, then you're you're no longer a three-win team. You're a, you're a six, seven-win team, and you're in control of the NFC East and could have a decent playoff spot. All right, so for my... Uh, buttery pick this week. It's kind of an odd one, I guess, even though considering that they lost, but I'm going with Derek Carr this week uh, for my buttery. I think he has been playing some really good football, underrated football uh, as of recent. You look at his um, his uh, stat line from this last game, it's nothing necessarily too fancy. He went 23-31, 275 yards, three touchdowns, one interception uh, in a loss to the Kansas City Chiefs. But here's the thing. they He led them to a victory against Kansas City early in the season, and he did what he was supposed to do on their last possession of the game uh, with a little over – it was like a minute and a half, minute 40 left. Uh, gets a touchdown and puts them up. It just so happened that they were going up against Patrick Mahomes, who is continuing to make a case that he he may win – very very well may win his second uh, MVP trophy this year excuse me um <clears throat> but i think he's playing some severely underrated football i think the raiders are playing great despite their six and four record um obviously it's going to be tough for them to try and get a playoff spot there's a lot of great teams that are starting to merge out of the afc uh so that just makes it even more contestants going to make it more difficult to try to get into the playoffs um but gruden isn't coaching that bad play calling hasn't been terrible. Uh, just the biggest thing is that if they had a defense and if they had a competent defensive coordinator, then perhaps, you know, they win a couple, maybe they have another win or two under their belt and they're not as stressed to win these last couple of games because Carr is playing well, although I would argue that Carr necessarily hasn't changed. He's the same Carr that we saw in 2016, like finish uh, almost like get votes for MVP, got that massive new contract, and that team was playing great and thought they were going to make some noise in the playoffs before he got hurt. Uh, but that's also the same Derek Carr that's stunk it up the past couple of years. Uh, but it, it's because Derek Carr is Derek Carr. He is what he is. But at least Gruden and this Raiders front office is starting to put weapons around him Offensive line's getting better, and he's got a competent running back and Jacobs behind him. Uh, so I think that they're set up for success, and I just want to give Carr the recognition. I see uh, uh, a lot of people on Twitter. I see Alex, fellow Vendetta writer Alex, who is a big Raiders fan, interacting with a lot of other Raiders fans, talking about how you can't put these losses on Derek Carr, and I 100% agree. The guy is doing everything that he can to try to put his team into success to win, and that's what he did this past week against Kansas City. It just so happened that with about a minute 30 on the field, uh, left on the clock, uh, yeah, we expect Patrick Mahomes to make that drive, but they scored in like under a minute. I don't care if it's, you know, Dan Marino, freaking Joe Montana <laughs> back there. You, you can't let that happen. No defense should let that happen, but that's something that the Raiders defense has done time and time again this season. Yeah, I 
I love Derek Carr. Um, I think even in previous episodes, you can go back and see, like, I always talk up Derek Carr. Uh, I never really, I never really saw why there was so much criticism about him in years past. Because if you just look at what the Raiders were in past years, they were they were rebuilding. Like they they had their quarterback, but they didn't have really much anything else, and they were rebuilding. But now it seems that the offense, at least, is um, pretty you know set up to be like a, a really good offense in this league. They got. You know, they got a stud in Josh Jacobs back there uh, at the running back position. They have uh, a much improved offensive line. Darren Waller is probably his top two tight end in the game or in the top three, depending on where you put mm-hmm. him, Kelsey, and Kittle. And uh, the receivers, the receivers, I like the receivers. Like even Nelson Aguilar is having like some sort of renaissance year. With- yeah. The Raiders, which is amazing. It's, it's crazy. They, they, he's got good weapons around him, and kudos yeah. for the front office for doing that. They just got to fix up that defense, and this is a playoff team. Yeah, that defense. I mean, listen, a minute 30 left on the clock. I don't care what quarterback is back there. You really just you, – you can't let them make it look so easy driving right down the field for a game-winning touchdown. And then uh, I'm sure you saw it when that uh, Mahomes threw that last touchdown to Travis Kelsey – he had maybe not – he had a corner. The closest corner to him was probably about, like, I want to say 15 to 20 yards away from him. Yeah, whoever was supposed to be playing zone back there <laughs> yeah. just decided, nah, man, I'm not going to play zone. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not. not I'm going to I'm just, I'm just go over here. And then Kelsey, yeah, just, just right behind him. <laughs> Wide open. Like, and that is 100% on the defense. That loss – I like I, I get it when a lot of people say, you know, oh, there's something that we could have done different throughout the game that, you know, we're not in that situation. Yeah, I agree. But you're in that situation. And so you got to show up in that situation. And that was a boneheaded play uh, by that safety. And it cost them the game uh, yeah. 100 percent. Yeah, well, listen, when the game comes down to you got to make a stop and you don't make that stop. I'm sorry that that's on that's on the defense, especially especially since the Raiders, I mean, they came out and their offense was, was was good. They were, you know, they scored all game. They, it's not like, it's not like they didn't score. (laughs) You just got to, I don't don't have the player in front of me, but whoever it was in the Raiders secondary, uh, uh, honorary burnt toast player of the week because of that play. (laughs) Whoever, whoever he is, uh, he's, 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 you know who you are. (laughs) All right. Well, on that segue, we'll go into our uh, burnt toast segment. And now we start going with the negativity, which is what I love. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll, get us, I'll get us started off here with, uh, oh, my God, Bears quarterback, Nick Foles. Nick Foles, <laughs> he's been in this spot before, but I'm sorry. When you lose me money, you're coming, <laughs> you, you are coming in this spot. I am sorry, but it's got to it's gonna happen. Nick Foles, I don't know what I, – I just don't understand. Like, I mean, could it be the offensive line is terrible? I mean, like, the offensive line is bad on the Bears. The play calling is pretty terrible too. But the only problem I have with this is, I mean, like, Nick Foles goes from Super Bowl MVP, goes to Jacksonville, gets his collarbone broken first game, then gets a spot taken by Garner Minshew – goes up to Chicago. Do you know how bad you have to be for Bears fans and myself to be campaigning for Mitch Trubisky to come back? I mean, do you know how, how terrible- I couldn't believe it. When I saw that, that was like three weeks ago. I saw that on Twitter, and I was like, that is a sad place to be in. Is there a sadder franchise that are in a position that is begging for Mitch Trubisky to come back out there on the field? That's so sad. I mean, it's – it's horrible. And it's, it's not even like, it's not even like it's just the fans just wanting a change. Cause like normally that's just the case, but statistically every offensive category, the bears have been worse with Nick Foles. They average less yards per game, less yards per play, less points per game. It's across the board or just a worse offense with Nick Foles. And I think part of it has got to do with, it's the uh, the play calling isn't isn't great. Okay, Matt Nagy just for some reason his whatever offensive system he's he's tried to put in there it's just 
not working with Nick Foles. And the offensive line is bad. Like, if you watch these games, these Bear games, Nick Foles has got pressure in his face within a matter of, like, half a second as soon as he gets the ball. And everyone knows Nick Foles has got bricks for feet, so he's not going anywhere. He's kind of just a – he's just a sitting duck just waiting for the DN to just take his head off. I mean, at least Mitch Trubisky could move around a little bit. So, I don't know. All I know is I'm just never betting on the Bears again, and I don't even know why I did that in the first place. But, Nick Foles, you are – Burnt toast. I can't stand you. I can't stand Matt Nagy. If I ever bet on the Bears again, it'll only be if Mitch Trubisky is back in the freaking game because I don't know what else to do with that team. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what Matt Nagy's deal is with, with Trubisky, but he just does not like him, and he refuses, <laughs> refuses to put him back in. It's kind of it's kind of funny. It, kind Mitch, of funny. Mitch Trubisky's got to have some sort of blackmail on Matt Nagy or something at this point. I mean, like, the way that Nagy just completely shuts down the idea of Mitch Trubisky coming back, it, it's like, you, you, man, you can't be any more subtle about how much you hate this guy. No. Um, all right, so we'll go with mine. And we've kind of hammered this on the head quite a bit on the site in recent weeks, especially uh, extremely recently. I know Trey and I – talked about it on the latest that's some cheese which you could catch on the youtube channel um subscribe by the way viewer if you are not subscribed mm -hmm. but uh and check out our merch shop buy a shirt rocking the vendetta merch right now myself so cool comfortable shirts go get you one uh but my burnt toast this week it is lamar jackson 186 yards one touchdown and one pick and a loss to the Tennessee Titans. This team, the wheels are starting to fall off this Ravens team. And right now, that the blame for that has to be put at the feet of Lamar. Now, Harbaugh can get it as well because it's, it's his team and it's his system that they're running. Uh, but Lamar is just, he is not completing his passes. He's seems like, he, he just can't get the ball out. Um, Marquise Brown, one of their top receivers, deep threats, zero receptions. Zero. He had three targets, zero receptions. That can't happen. Des Bryant, who, the, who hasn't played in, what, like two or three years? He got four catches, for goodness sakes. They signed him to the friggin' practice squad last week, and he gets four catches, but you can't get the ball to your deep threat. And that is telling me that Lamar, he can't move the ball unless he's, unless he's running it. And people will continue to defend Lamar. And as, as Trey said, is that they'll continue to move – the goalposts and they'll continue to change the narrative all in an effort to continue pushing that Lamar Jackson is a good quarterback. And that may have been the case, his rookie season, but guess what? There are smart defensive coordinators in this league that it takes them time to learn and understand how a quarterback works. But once they figure it out, then we got to see something new from the quarterback. We got to see something new from Lamar. And we don't see anything new from Lamar. We see the same type of gimmicks, the same type of plays, the same type of system that they have run the past three years. They are not evolving, but the rest of the league has to stop them, which means that you have to rely more on your arm than you do your legs because they're containing you. And he's not doing that. He can't get the ball out. And so the, the wheels are coming off, and they may completely fall off very soon, even though the Thursday night game, which I'm so upset about, the Thursday night game between them and the Steelers got, um, uh, got delayed until Sunday because uh, the Ravens decided that they weren't going to follow COVID protocols, and so now they're having to move the game on to Sunday. Um, but I'm fully expecting Baltimore to lose that game. If they do, they fall to six and five, and they may not make the playoffs. And this is a team that Colin Cowherd said was going to go 16 and 0. <laughs> <laughs> they could be, they very may well be six and five 
and may not make the playoffs. There will be no more room for error, and they are going to make a ton of errors between now and week 17. It's just – it's fallen off. Yeah. L- Lamar Jackson has not <clears> – <throat> he's, he's not done anything different. And, like, I've said this – I've said this before in uh, previous Toast Time episodes, and it's just, like, he – This whole, like, stage of his career right now is reminding me way too much of Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. And, like, I I don't want it to be. Like, I don't want Lamar Jackson to fall off the cliff like Colin Kaepernick just, like, fell off the cliff. And, you know, I really don't want that to happen to the guy. But, listen, man, when you are a runner like Colin Kaepernick, they had that read option system in San Francisco, took the league by storm, they made it all the way to the Super Bowl. I mean, they were just blowing teams away. And within the next two years, they couldn't do it anymore. They could not run that system anymore. Like, it was just defenses caught up to it, and that was it. It was over. Like, these these gimmicky offenses that come into the league every now and then, they eventually they die out very quickly. His defensive coordinators you, in the NFL. You get like months. one season. You get not, one maybe season not even a full it. season. Maybe yeah. not even a full season. You, but you get maybe ten to twelve games for this gimmick to work, and then you're going to run into uh, a coordinator or a head coach that knows what they're doing, that's defensive minded, and is going to have a lot of tape on you. And that's and that's why we see them putter out uh, in the in the playoffs the past few yeah. years. They can't win a playoff game. Now it looks like they may not even be back in the playoffs. And they have, on paper, one of the more talented teams in the league. Yeah, I mean, also, Lamar Jackson, like, his his throwing was never, like, great. But, see, last year, it was easier for him to throw the ball because he could run. Teams weren't really adapted quite yet to his speed and his elusiveness. Now, the problem is they are. Everybody's caught up to how fast you are, Lamar Jackson, and they know what you can do. So now the problem is they're going to take that away from you and make you beat them with uh, with your arm, which, as he's shown this entire season, he cannot do. And if that doesn't get cleaned up, uh, the, the Ravens might damn well miss the playoffs. Yeah, he hasn't thrown for 250 yards since week one. I think week one, I will double-check it. Real quickly, but yeah, I don't think week since week one has. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to stall because my internet is being <laughs> obnoxious right now, so I'm trying to I'm trying, oh, trying to click the week. Yeah, 275 yards yep. Yep. on week one, uh, but he has not thrown for 250 yards since. That that can't happen. That can't happen. No, it just can't. It just can't happen. And uh, this team is. Uh, they're going to be fighting. They're, they're fighting for their lives. I'll tell you that. They are fighting for their lives this weekend against the Steelers. But uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with that. I'm predicting that they're going to get blown out, to be quite honest with you. But we'll see what happens. Yeah, and uh, then there's a lot of trap games in between then and the rest of the season. So who knows? Yeah. But we'll go into our extra crispy segment, which – one of my personal favorites. Love this segment. This is where we. <laughs> this is where we get into. This is where we get into uh, the guys that really, really deserve to be <laughs> put out there. So my candidate this week is none other than Eagles head coach Doug Peterson. He has been a <laughs> constant talking point on this show, and you know what? He's going to continue to be. I'm sorry, but Doug Peterson, you're going to continue to be a talking point on this show. You come out of the bye week. And you played the Giants coming out of the bye week. The New York football Giants kicked the crap out of you. Now, as a Giants fan, I never, ever, ever expect a Giants team to kick the crap out of an Eagles team. I'll tell you that right now. Mm-hmm. At least within the past five years, it has not happened. We could barely even we could barely even beat them, let alone, let alone run, almost run away with the game, which is basically kind of what the Giants uh, did. I mean, the Eagles – just looked horrible. They looked horrendous. Their offense was sputtering, and there wasn't anything that Carson Wentz could even do about it. And I'm sorry, but it falls on Doug Peterson. I mean, 
you were just – there was guys completely unblocked rushing right at Carson Wentz. He's getting pressure in his face all game long. The center is snapping balls over his head, you know, uh, in, in, into his shoe. Like, I don't know what was going on in that game. And then you come out of that game, you got a bad taste in your mouth. You just lost to a divisional opponent. Like, you just let the whole NFC East back into the division now. So, you know, you're thinking, all right, we're going to come out here against the Browns, you know, show some heart. They didn't show no heart. They got, they got stomped on by the Cleveland Browns. And even this is even a Cleveland Browns team that still can't throw the ball. All they can do is run and play defense. And, I mean, the Eagles just shot themselves in the foot way too many times in that game. It was, it was just terrible to watch, to be honest. I mean, Carson Wentz, I know that this, it doesn't all fall on Carson Wentz. And it, it really doesn't because he's got a lot of guys hurt. I get that. There are a ton of people hurt. But I'm sorry. Alshon Jeffrey is back. I haven't seen Alshon Jeffrey, like, make a play. Not even make a play. I haven't even seen him get the ball. Like, no. Alshon Jeffrey has just been basically a non-factor since he's returned. And the rest of this offense, with Miles Sanders coming back, has looked horrible. And, you know, the defense can – the defense is good enough to hold an opposing team for most of the game, but when your offense continuously can't score, that other team is going to start breaking through, and then you'll be out of that game really, really quickly. And Doug Peterson just has no answer for any of this. Like, what happened? You win the Super Bowl, and, like, you just – you just decided to just call it quits. Like you're just throwing in the towel basically at this point, Like you just don't even want to, like you don't even want to attempt to, to keep your job in Philadelphia because you know, Super Bowls, it, 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 it was nice. Like it was great. You know, yeah. the Eagles are on their first Super Bowl, but that was, that was three years ago going on four years <laughs> soon enough. They're going to, they're, they're going to forget about the one Super Bowl you got them. And uh, it's going to be, what have you done for me lately? And lately yeah. <laughs> turned the Eagles into an utter mess. Yeah. And that, that Super Bowl, it's just getting more and more into the past. You can't, it's stupid if the Eagles are riding on, well, he got us a Super Bowl. Like, so you had an actually good team that year and they yeah. were fairly healthy. You had, well, first of all, your Super Bowl MVP, Nick Foles, is playing in Chicago, so they clearly <laughs> didn't care about the Super Bowl that much. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but Doug Peterson, just he's just got – I don't know. He's got to get it together. The Eagles got to get it together, although I think they won't get it together. They won't win the NFC East. I'm sorry. They've had way too many chances to win this division, and it's just not happened. And at this point, it's not going to happen. They have – I think the easiest schedule remaining out of the three out of the four NFC East teams. And I can guarantee you that they will not make it. The giants will make it before them. And the giants have a four week stretch where they played the Cardinals, the Seahawks, the Browns and the Ravens. Mm. Yeah. I don't know who made, I don't know who made the giant. I really don't know who makes the giant schedule. I really don't know That's who a takes tough. a look at who, who looks at our team from the previous year and says, yeah, no, this is a fair schedule for them. Like, like, yeah, sure. Just play the best, <laughs> just play the best teams in the NFL. No problem. Like, like they're, they'll be fine. Yeah. Just, just, just give them all prep games for, for the playoffs. <laughs> yeah, you <know>? exactly. Like, <laughs> the giants will be the punching bag. <laughs> Final four weeks. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well then we, uh, we both picked, head coaches and I have I have picked him before and I am just in awe of this it is Matt Patricia the Detroit Lions how do you drop a goose <laughs> egg zero you didn't score anything against the Panthers nothing you held them to 20 points I'll give you that but you didn't score anything this is a team where most of their starting most of their starters are defense are rookies. They're missing their best player in Christian McCaffrey. They're missing their starting quarterback. They have so many injuries. And you didn't score anything. It is the most pathetic thing I've ever seen. Matt Stafford, horrible. 18 of 33 for 178 yards. Dude's running for his life back there. 
your leading rusher was Adrian Peterson with 18 <laughs> yards. Oh my god, dude, it is just I was in awe about this game and I I don't know what else to say. I don't know how Lions fans or that front off I don't know how Lions fans can sit there with a straight face and say, this is fine, like the meme where it's the dog and the, the whole house is on fire <laughs> behind awesome. him. And I don't, I don't know how, as a front office with dedicated and loyal fans, can you continuously sit there and put out this kind of product with Matt Patricia as your head coach? This dude needs to go. Get him out of there. Don't even wait for the end of the season. Just fire him and, and, and promote one of the uh, uh, promote one of the coordinators. At least then, if you lose, so what? You're going to lose it anyway. Maybe even lose it worse to Matt Patricia. At least here, you may score a touchdown if one of the coordinators <laughs> is the head coach, but not with Matt Patricia as your head coach. Get this dude off the team. Start your coaching search. Find someone new. And you just got to blow the whole thing up. If you're going to be this bad, don't be paying Matthew Stafford like hundreds of millions of dollars to lead this franchise. Just blow it all up and start from scratch. Shoot. Maybe the Lions should even be the team that moves to London. <laughs> maybe just completely rebrand the franchise because the, the Detroit Lions are a cursed franchise. Whenever they do get good players, they run them into the ground. And so they retire early, um, you know, stealing us fans that aren't Lions fans, but love, love Barry Sanders, generational talent, love Calvin Johnson. The dude's a freak. He's going to be a first ballot hall of famer. Dude only played like five seasons in the league. And he's going to be a first ballot hall of famer because he's up for it this year. Just, that is just, oh, I don't even know what to say. Go, go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, when I was, I was watching, uh, I was watching the game Sunday and I just pulled it up on like my fantasy cast and I seen Lions are down 20 to nothing to an XFL quarterback. <laughs> PJ Walk. I was, <laughs> I said, this guy was in the XFL really? last year. Yeah, what was he playing for? Was it the Houston team? The was Houston the Roughnecks. The Houston Roughnecks. Yeah, Houston Roughnecks. <laughs> I was in just – I don't know. I can't even say I'm in shock because nothing surprises me with the Detroit Lions. I have a friend who's a Lions fan, and I every Sunday I always end up texting him, and I'm like, how about those Lions? And he just, he just tells me how he just can't stand it. Like, Lions fans just – it's gotten to the point where it's so depressing – being a Lions fan, that they're just used to it. They're yeah. just they're, – they're, they're used to this at this point. And Matt yeah, Patricia, how he still has a job is – I cannot believe. That is unbelievable how that front office could sit there and look at him and go, nah, this guy, he's our guy. Don't worry about it. We'll, we just need to get him a better roster. I can't even – I just can't believe that he still has a job. I, it's it's bad. Like, it's really bad in Detroit. And also, you brought up a very good point. The Detroit Lions, that franchise, I'm tired of them taking great players from us and making them retire in, in less than 10 seasons. I'm sick of it. You got Megatron literally said when he retired, I'm tired of losing. I can't do this anymore. And he left. They made him hate football so much he just left football. You, you like, made he could have gone anywhere no. else. There are 31 other teams that would have loved to have him, would have opened their arms and their pocketbooks, and would have said, please, for the love of God. You don't think Bill Belichick and Tom Brady would not have wanted Megatron? There's, there's all these other teams, but he hated football so much because of the Lions. He's just like, I'm out. <laughs> He's like, I'm good. I'm – I'm gone. A guy that could literally be triple covered and you knew he was going to catch the ball. That it, it, if, if he was playing, like if he was like still playing, because he could have still probably been playing until recently, if not yeah. this year, because he's just that much of a beast. He could have been the greatest receiver of all time. And, and that's the saddest thing. He <laughs> literally could have been. Everyone would have been like Jerry Rice, who, yeah, he was all right. No Megatron. You know, Randy Moss, yeah, could run quick and got deep, got three catches, 200 yards and three touchdowns in a game. But he's not Megatron. 
He's not going to have the entire defense covering him, and he's going to have this much space of clearance <laughs> over the defender to catch it. Yeah, the Lions, curse franchise, Matt Patricia, uh, really bad coach. He's got to get out. He's got to get out of there. Yeah. Like, yeah. I got a friend that is all Detroit sports. Yeah. And all he does is tweet about the Pistons now. There's like, I have seen no tweets about the Lions. <laughs> it's just all Pistons stuff. <laughs> It's isn't it sad as a Detroit fan that your bright spot at this very moment in time is the Pistons? Ah. <laughs> isn't isn't that sad? Yeah, and all the screw ups they've been making. In Ex- exactly, exactly. Oh, that's <laughs> that's, that's rough. <laughs> so, all right, well, can I segue here into our toast of the week now? My toast candidate of the week is none other than the GOAT, Tom Brady. Tom Brady this season has been horrible on Monday Night Football. And as old Tom Brady fashion, after losses, he's a big old crybaby. He does, he's a big old crybaby. He just, okay, listen, you lost to the Rams. It was a close game. I mean, you didn't you didn't have your best game. You had a you know, it, it wasn't good. But it's it's the Rams. They have a pretty they have a real good defense. You know, it was a Monday night game, whatever. It, it's just you just chalk it up as a loss and you move on. Tom Brady has this thing where if he loses, he doesn't want to shake nobody's hand. He runs right back into the locker room <laughs> crying, about to go call up Giselle. Uh, I just lost. The media is going to talk bad about me. I don't want to <laughs> shake anybody's hand. And, like, he did this to Nick Foles when they lost to the Bears on Thursday night. He did this now to Jared Goff. And it's just, you know, it, it, it's like disrespectful, especially being that you played both of these guys in the Super Bowl. You lost to one and you beat one. Like, th- there should be some mutual respect when you go to Super Bowls and you play and you're the opposing quarterback. Like, most of these guys have that mutual respect. Like, Tom Brady, he actually has it for Eli, who beat him twice in the Super Bowl. But... God forbid Tom Brady loses to anybody else. He don't want to shake no one's hand. He just wants to go run right back to the locker room and cry and sulk and probably have to listen to Bruce Arians go talk crap about him in the media after the game. Like, <laughs> it's just, you know, Tom Brady, this, this Bucks team, this Bucks team, they're getting to the point of, like, it, it, the NFC South is basically over. You already lost two games to the Saints. Forget about that. That ship has sailed. Your next objective is to get the wild card and, you know, make the playoffs. And, you are you know, that's where you will really be judged is in the playoffs. But this team is just constructed with just a bunch of old superstars and young emerging stars. And it's just a clash of, in my opinion, a clash of too many cultures into one. And I really don't see – the Bucks winning the Super Bowl, and if they don't, this is going to be just a big, big failure for Tampa Bay. They gave, you know, money to everybody just to come and play. They they brought in so many people to come play. They got Tom Brady in there. They didn't draft a quarterback either. Knowing you're getting rid of Jameis Winston, you go and you, you didn't even draft a quarterback. So they're back. They, there is no backup plan. It's Super Bowl or bust. And that's it. And Tom Brady, uh, you got to stop being a little crybaby. You won six Super Bowls. You're probably the greatest quarterback of all time. Stop crying if you lost a regular season game. It ain't a big deal. <laughs> yeah, see, great minds think alike because Brady was mine too. The Brady was yours too. Yeah, so – and I was trying to look around and see if there's another one. But there's just no one more perfect this week than Brady. It was just awful. All Like, the like yeah, it wasn't too terrible. Like, I don't know. It's – to me, it was it was a bad performance. There were some, you know, bad throws again tonight, bad interceptions. I guess the only other angle that you can attack this from is for being toast of the week uh, is the um, the Bucks secondary because how do you let Goff throw fifty one times <laughs> and get almost four hundred yards? Cooper Cup and Robert Woods each had 
<laughs> a day. Cooper Cup, 145 yards receiving. Woods, 130 yards. They got they got torched. It was a terrible – and it's amazing that it was only a three-point game. Um, and I, I don't believe in golf. I'm not a believer in him. And you just let that dude burn you to a crisp. It's nuts. But I agree with everything you said about Tom Brady. He shouldn't have any excuses because he has all these offensive weapons. Antonio Brown, Chris, Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Rob Gronkowski, Ronald Jones out of the backfield. And they went and signed Leonard Fournette. Everyone's, you know – you know, foaming at the mouth. Oh my God, they got Leonard Fournette. Uh, but yeah, and like you said, it is Super Bowl or bust this year, and it it looks like it looks like bust. It a hundred percent looks like bust. I know a lot of people picked them to win the Super Bowl just because they had Tom Brady and because they had all these weapons, and they saying it was going to be you know great and fantastic. Uh, but I wasn't too much of a believer uh, in them. When the season started, I didn't think they were going to win the Super Bowl. I think that I didn't even think, like, even in weeks they were winning, that there were still a couple teams better than them in the NFC. So I didn't even think that they were the best team in their own uh, uh, their own conference. But it's looking rough for Brady and the Bucks and company. Yeah, it's trending towards bust, and you know, Tom. The thing is, it's not going to really. It's not going to hurt Tom Brady's legacy. I mean, guys already won six Super Bowls. Really, not much you could say about him. Yeah. But I mean, for the Bucks organization and you know other guys on the team, yeah, you know it, it'll it'll hurt. It'll hurt. So Tom Brady's got to have a little more leadership there, and you know, really uh, pull his head out of his ass. Yeah, and they play. They play. Their next game is against the Chiefs, and if they get if they just get torched in that game, then that's that's essentially the last nail in the coffin. Like they may win the last. Four games because they got Vikings, Lions, and Falcons twice. Uh, but you get blown out against the against the Chiefs. Um, you lose one of these games. I don't foresee the Saints completely imploding, even with um, Breeze probably going to be missing some more time. Uh, but it, it, they're probably going to get a wild card team. They're gonna they're probably going to be a wild card team, and they're gonna they're gonna get schlacked by somebody in the playoffs. Yeah, it's. Probably yeah, it's gonna happen. They, I mean, listen, if they if they end up playing the Saints again, lose to the Saints for a third time, which I very well think could could happen. Um, even even if Drew Brees isn't playing, how how poetic would it be if Jameis Winston gets to start in a playoff game against the Bucks and beats them to like go to the NFC Championship <laughs> game or go to the Super Bowl if that's where they're if that's where they're seated in? I'd be here for playing. it. Oh, I'd love I it. would. I would love, the- I would love it. I would absolutely love it. James Winston, man, going to be eating those W's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Well, now we got one of my favorite ones is Soggy Toast. My Soggy Toast player uh, this season has been Mark Ingram, the man who dubbed Lamar Jackson Big Trust. Big, oh, Big Trust. <laughs> Mark Ingram has done absolutely nothing this year. Like, it's just – now you can say this for almost anybody on the Ravens offense, but Mark Ingram just bro, you've done no, like nothing at all. The the running back position in Baltimore last season and just the running game in general was really really good. Yeah, Lamar Jackson, you know, uh, Mark Ingram was having a good year last year, but this year has just been terrible. He, I think, in fantasy, he's like. RB like 40. Uh, he's just fallen off an absolute cliff. And this was a guy who I really, really like. I'm I'm an Alabama fan, college football. And Mark Ingram was one of my favorite guys when he was at Alabama. And I even really liked him on the Saints. I liked that little thing they had with Kam- him and Kamara. And then, you know, he wanted to go and be his own guy. And I get that. That's all well and good. But you've just had such a bad bad year and then on top of it you're in the like you're always in these press conferences with the you you know with the with the big trust thing and all this other and all this other crap and you just don't he just doesn't perform week in week out it's just the same stuff he doesn't perform the Ravens offense doesn't perform and 
Like that whole team is just trending down more and more. But Mark Ingram, man, you are my soggy toes player of the week. You join the likes of guys like Evan Ingram. So I hope you feel really good about yourself right now because you've just been terrible this season and I don't really see a way for you to rectify it because J.K. Dobbins is about to take your job, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a good one. Dobbins is a great player. I liked him coming out like of the draft. Dobbins. Yeah, yeah I, I love Dobbins. And in a league that is starting to put less and less value at the running back position, like obviously you need a good run game, uh, but it almost seems like when a running back starts to get really good what they're doing like the stuff that they're doing on the field you can find uh you know at least a dozen running backs that could probably get you just as good of production out of the backfield and you could just draft them and you can keep them for five six years you know you know you could obviously pick up their fifth year option you keep them pretty cheap for five years if but if they start getting too good and they start demanding too much money then you just go find another one you know they're just there's just now this rotational uh you know carousel of running backs at the NFL. Uh, but yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good one. He hasn't done anything this year. Uh, all the talk of him last year, you know, you know, talking about him and Derek Henry as, you know, starting to really take over the league, but yeah, Mark Ingram, he's starting to fade away again. He, yeah. he didn't make too much noise, made a lot of noise last year. Uh, and then everyone hyped him up and now he's slowly disappearing. And obviously the Ravens knew something was up because they went out and then they drafted, J.K. Dobbins, yeah. they didn't, you know, they spent a decent pick on him instead of, you know, going out and get another position. All right, so my soggy toast player, it's not a player that I necessarily have, and he's he's missed some time this year, so this may be unfair, but I don't think it is because it, he used to be one of the big name, uh, big name wine receivers in the league, and now – Everyone is starting to forget about him, and it's Sammy Watkins. This dude's production, he's getting outproduced by Demarcus Robinson right now on there. And, and like I said, now Robinson has played nearly double the games and uh, has uh, – and Watkins already has, you know, less than uh, – only single digits. You know, it's like nine less targets – uh, and is cl- just under like 30 yards, 30, 40 yards uh, difference between the two. Uh, but man, this is supposed to be the number two guy on here. And um, Robin, like I said, Demarcus Robinson and um, uh, Hardman are having fantastic seasons. So he's honestly like, and then of course you tie, you put in Travis Kelsey, you got Clyde Edwards Hilaire out of the backfield as an option, even Le'Veon Bell as the option. Now he is slowly starting to fall down the depth chart as in, tar- in who on what order the pegging order is uh, in the reads that, uh, that, uh, wow. Well, brain just died on me uh <laughs> Mahomes on what Mahomes is is trying to do and he's like in the last five games that he's played the most targets that he ever had was um in a game against Houston he had nine targets that game fairly good game but it's like in the game uh which he's like I said he's missed a lot of time as of recent because uh, the last game that he played in was um so this is why it's kind of unfair um, but he's just kind of nowhere to be found now. He's listed as active, but he's just non-existent. Yeah, Sammy Watkins, I've always been really hesitant to draft him in fantasy leagues, only because, like, not and, and, only... and it's not just, and it's just, let me clarify, it's also not yeah. just this year, because I've had him in previous years. I've had him, I think, every year that he's been with Kansas City, mm-hmm. and it's been the same story. So this isn't just a this year thing. This is the past couple of year thing when I, cause I really had to think about who I wanted to pick to put for here. And Sammy Watkins is a guy that just does not produce anymore. This Even is, when he's he doesn't produce this, this has been building up with you for quite a while. Yes, now. it has. And now I'm going to let it spill out <laughs> now that, you know, it looks like, you know, now that he's healthy and coming back, now it's time for me to, you know, try to beat him back down again. <laughs> I've always been like really hesitant about drafting Sammy Watkins in fantasy leagues. Like I think I've always had the opportunity to, but I ended up always passing up on him because it's not only is he a home run or nothing uh, 
player, like both fantasy wise and just like regular football wise. But on top of it, he can't, he hasn't been able to stay healthy. So you're going to, you know, give me a guy that can't stay healthy. And then even when he does play is so boomer bust that it would, it's not even worth it for me to, to trust him with, with the start. It's basically just, I'm just throwing darts at a dartboard at that point, trying to hope, hopefully get a 20 out of him, you know? So I never, I never want to draft Sammy Watkins. I, I necessarily really don't like drafting him. I just feel like as far as Kansas city goes, that chief's offense fantasy wise is always really weird to me because there's, it's always Travis Kelsey or Tyree kill. Now, if you could find yourself uh, a guy, Marco Hardman or the Marcus Robinson, you know, it's like the outliers receivers on that and that offense are boomer bust players, which you would think with a guy like Pat Mahomes, he would spread the ball out to everybody. But listen, you always know you're going to have your Hill and Travis Kelsey. Anybody else on that team is kind of just hit or miss. And uh, if you're relying on anyone, definitely wouldn't be Sammy Watkins. I'll tell you that. All right. So and go and give our prediction for toast player this coming week. I tell you, I got one right here. Because uh, I just – the overhype that I have seen – I don't know if anybody else, I don't know if other people have seen it, but I've seen it on Twitter from Saints fans. I For some reason, I follow a lot of Saints fans. I really don't know why. But the overhype of Taysom Hill, he's going to come back down to earth so quickly. <laughs> it's not even – I mean – I'll tell you what, this should honestly even be, this should be more on the Falcons than it was on Sean Payton's offense in Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill, before last week, threw less than 10 pass attempts in his entire career, <laughs> almost a season and a half with Drew Brees missing time. And he does get playing time even with Drew Brees in there. Yeah less than 10 passing attempts. And the Falcons let this man throw for 233 yards on them. <laughs> I mean, listen, that is not going to happen again. Not even close. They play Denver next week. Denver's got a, a much better defense than the Falcons. Banged up, yes, but still a lot better than the Falcons. Taysom Hill is going to come back down to earth very quickly. And Saints fans are going to be – they're going to be eating the cheese. They're going to be begging for Jameis to come in. I'm telling you, because you can't you, you can't win with these types of quarterbacks. I'm sorry, but the guy can barely throw as it is. He mainly just runs, just takes these direct snaps, or he's catches the ball. And also another thing, him being listed as a tight end in ESPN was so ridiculous. It wasn't even funny. Now, I yeah, only they, say it was ridiculous because I didn't get to get him. Yeah. Behind somebody in the yeah, waiver order. Most of the people that got double the points. Yeah. You got that. quarterback points for a tight end. Yeah. So uh, he, ESPN, I saw a notification from the fantasy app that said that's not going to happen again, that he is locked out of the tight end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I seen that. Yeah, he's uh, he's been listed as a quarterback now. Uh, going yeah. forward, that, that that was a one week thing, which honestly they should have corrected that as soon as it happened. Although I can understand because nobody thought Taysom Hill was getting the start. I no, certainly I mean, didn't at all. Um, but he's going to come back down to earth next week against Denver. He's going to have a really str- he's going to struggle. That offense is going to struggle just because he can't throw, and they're going to be relying on him to run. And they're going to be relying on Alvin Kamara. And I just, he's just going to fall right back down to earth. Do not expect him to be thrown all over the place again because that will not happen. I agree. Yeah. Um, I think now that a team has some game film on him and the, the Broncos put the they put the hurt on my Dolphins this past week. You know, they pumped the brakes on uh, everyone, which uh, I still think me. it's going to. Yeah, that, it, that hurt me. The Dolphins were my cover machine all year. Yeah, and they, and they lost. That really hurt me inside. But, I, I felt you know, terrible. People were riding the you know the Dolphin wave. You know, I was you know as a Dolphins fan, I was appreciative of the love, but you know people needed to pump the brakes. Like people were putting the Dolphins in like their top fives, and I'm like, hold hold on, hold on, no, we're <laughs> not a top five team. We're playing great. All it's going to take is one team to, and we're 
you know, to derail one thing that we're doing. You know, defense doesn't get uh, a stop when it needs to. You know, rookie quarterback, young team in general. It's like we're we're gonna lose if we make the playoffs. You know, I'm still not even expecting us to make the playoffs. If we make the playoffs, I'm like, hell yeah, great season. Oh my gosh, things are looking great. But um, yeah, the um, it, but the only thing that he has going for him is the same thing like what Breeze had and the same thing that Bridgewater had last year when he filled in for Breeze when he was injured as he's got Kamara. And even though Thomas hasn't really been productive, he still has Mike Thomas. So he's got that going for him. But I can easily see where he comes back down to earth. And so yeah. you may very well be right. So my prediction, I used him this week. Uh, Lamar. He was my uh, burnt, but if he, if if the game goes the way that I think he does, then he will be extra crispy oh. because he is going up against this mm-hmm. Steelers team. The wheels are falling off. Not only now do the Steelers have a little bit of tape on him, you know, before their first game uh, that they played against them this year, but now they have a lot more tape on them. They know what works, wasn't uh, what doesn't work uh, in that game uh, against the Ravens. Things were looking kind of shaky, but Pittsburgh made adjustments at the half to come back and win that game. And I think this time they they just put the hammer down, and I think that they put the hurt on Lamar. I think that defense will come in and rock his world. And when that happens, he is going to me be my burnt because he's not going to get 250 yards, may not even get 200 yards, maybe gets 50 yards rushing, will probably get maybe one or two touchdowns, but he's going to, you know, Mika Fitzpatrick is back there. He's going to be able to read him easily. i am always been a big fan of Mika ever since the Dolphins drafted him. I loved that pick, and it was so heartbreaking when he got traded. I felt like my whole world was just collapsing around me because I was like, no, he's like the one good piece that we have. And I wish he was on this Dolphins team right now. If so, then we may, then we might as well, we may have won the freaking AFC East, which blows my mind. I honestly think he's that good of a player. But I think, I think the Ravens get rocked. I think Lamar gets rocked. And I think their playoff chances get rocked. Uh, with a loss this week, because like I said, that puts them at six and five, and that is going to be one hell of a climb to try to make back up, because they won't be winning the division, and those playoff spots, the closer we get, even with adding one playoff spot, they are still more coveted now, because there's a lot more teams that will have similar records that are going to be trying to get in that I think are better and have better quarterbacks. Yeah, Lamar... This game for Lamar uh, just has – it's literally it, – it's just got beat down from the Steelers all over it. I mean – And, and it's, it's pivotal not just for the season, but maybe even I, – I mean, I don't want to be over dramatic, but yeah, career Yeah, you know, see, the thing is you always have to start, like, thinking about that. I'll tell you, you know, uh, I could even go to – honestly, okay, but look. Not in the same stratosphere player-wise as far as what they've done, but same kind of the same situation if you want to put it this way. Uh, Daniel Jones, when the Giants were doing horrible, they were like one in, uh, one in seven, and Daniel Jones was doing playing horribly. If uh, Daniel Jones didn't play well for the last uh, eight games of the season, you know – the more the Giants fell into a top five pick, the more the talk was coming that they were going to take uh, another quarterback, whether they ended up with the one or the two or, you know, took Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields and move on from Daniel Jones just because he wasn't making any improvements. And see, the thing, thing is Daniel Jones, the past two weeks, hasn't turned over the ball, which is the biggest part of his game. That's the issue. That's why the Giants have won two games in a row because he didn't turn over the ball. And with those improvements, he's sort of, you know, kind of fixed the narrative a little bit or took, you know, took that narrative and kind of like shoved it away to where it's not really being brought up anymore because he's playing better. Like he's starting to improve. Lamar Jackson, it's going to start getting like that, whether this week or soon by the end of the year or you know next season but you know you gotta you gotta improve like we get it you won mvp that's great and all but that was a season ago you know what have you done for me lately and what he's done lately has been not good at all 
And this division in the AFC North is stacked. It is tough. You know, even with the Bengals and Joe Burrow going down, poor Joe Burrow. But, you know, two years from now, the Bengals, I, I think, are going to be a pretty decent team. You will have four very, you know, decent or very good teams in that division. And, you know, it's all going to be judged on the quarterback play. Lamar just gets lucky right now because he's got a quarterback by the name of Baker Mayfield in his division that's, you know, no matter what Lamar does, Baker Mayfield will always be the worst quarterback in that division. So he is lucky he's got that on his side, but he's got to start doing something soon because uh, it just is not looking right at all. And this Steelers game has got a – it's just got the Steelers just blowing them out the water, written all over it. And I can absolutely see that coming. Mm-hmm. Well, all right, that wraps it up for Toast Time this week. I uh, want to say happy Thanksgiving to everybody watching. Uh, thank you, Jackson, for joining me as always. And uh, I would like everyone to subscribe to uh, the YouTube channel, which we get a lot of viewers that don't subscribe to the channel. It takes two seconds. You get notifications on when we post new videos. Um, you know, more the more everyone subscribes the more content me Jackson and the guys at Vendetta sports can uh, uh, give you guys uh, great content, but yeah, uh, it was a great show today. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And um, you come catch us on Vendetta sports media. That would be our site. I'll post, you know, you'll see it. Uh, go read our articles. Um, also we have a Patreon page. Uh, we'll post that in the description. Uh, down below of this video and um yeah so happy thanksgiving everybody and we'll catch you next week